Assalamu alaikum and welcome to your weekly edition of Morning Break. I'm Fatma Rizvi. And I'm Hamera Mirza. And today we have a jam packed show for you with our regular features such as discussing current affairs. We have our life coach, we have Hadith of the Week, an interview with a very special guest. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to meeting our young special guest. I hear her all the time, so it'll be great to actually finally meet her and put a, a, put a, a face to, to that beautiful, beautiful voice that she has. But right now, it is time for Hadith of the Week. So, what Hadith have you picked out, Hamera? Well, I've picked a Hadith from Imam Ali al-Islam, and it is, uh, prefer to be one who is overcome while being just, rather than one who triumphs while being unjust. Um, and... I mean, to be honest, the, the main reason why I picked this out was I just think that sentence is pretty much sums up what everything that happened in Karbala, all the events of of what happened to Imam Hussein and his beloved family, and I just I love the fact that here you've clearly got an example of a father passing his teachings to his son, and not just passing teachings, but they're literally living the teachings as well, um, and I think that's really important that concept is something that runs throughout Islam, which is that concept of justice. Absolutely, yeah, and also um, it's just like, um, I think it's reiterating also the fact that um, make sure that you're not the oppressor. So, you know, if you're oppressed, but make sure that you are not the, the one that is subjecting oppression. And of course we can see that the Ahl Bayt al were the ones that were the most severely, severely oppressed. Yeah, I completely agree with what you said about making sure that we aren't the oppressor. And I think that's something that's particularly uh, prominent within Islam in general. Um, and, you know, many times we've heard the Imams mention, you know, things like making sure that you protest, making sure you stand up for other people's rights as well as your own. And making and and you know again very much emphasised um, by all the imams is the fact that um, you know it's better to it is better to die um, as a just person than to die than to remain alive and be an unjust because of the fact that ultimately we are going to face Allah one day and we're going to have to answer for what we have done and so I guess that the actions that are better here is to to make sure that you're sticking to what's right the truth. That is so, so true, yeah. And obviously we are all accountable for our actions. So, of course, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's, it's better to be, um, definitely not to be uh, unjust or the, be, or the oppressor. And, um, yeah, hopefully our viewers can, can definitely take that on board too and take something away from Imam Ali Islam's um, great words. Mm. Inshallah, definitely. Okay, so now it's time for Article of the Week. This week we have an article from the Independent newspaper um, and it's the title of it is Britain's rarest flower given round-the-clock police protection. I just chose this because I found it quite funny, although I totally understand where they're coming from. Apparently there's this rare flower, um, in, in the UK anyway, that's called a lady slipper or orchid. Um, and I, I actually checked out a picture of it to see what all the fuss is about. And it's, it's a very beautiful flower. It almost looks a little bit like a, a, sh like a slipper. Um, it's very delicate and uh, the colours are beautiful. And so basically what's happened is that someone spotted, in Lancashire, someone spotted the fact that this, this flower is there. And, and so they have made sure, if I read this quote, it says, Lancashire police confirmed yesterday that they had mounted an extensive operation to protect the Silverdale orchid. Um, and so police tape surrounds the site. Police are regularly walking around there. Um, and a lot of you know, work has been done to make sure that this rare flower is protected. Um, they've even got CCTV footage, etc., in case anyone does anything. So uh, uh, this is a serious article, as in this is completely legit, as in they really are giving this, this sort of flower MI6, MI5 protection. <laughs> this is completely legit, it's true. But I have to say, although it's funny, I, I did read it and think, are you serious? At the same time, I think it's, this is why I think this country, um, and what I love about it, is the fact that it's well preserved. If you go to any national heritage sites, things are looked after so nicely. I mean, you know, there's special gardens that are for specific type of flowers. And unfortunately, for example, you know, I come from Pakistan, and when you go to Pakistan, even the most beautiful of places like Lahore Fort, so historical and, and, and amazing in terms mm. of the structure and architect, architecture, it's not even preserved properly. And that's because we don't go this full length to actually make sure that, 
you know, I, I'm not saying that this, you know, this does sound a little bit extreme, but I just, I like the fact that they, it's the fact that it's rare, we're not sure, you know, we need to make sure that it's protected so that we can ensure that it stays in this country, and I know it may just be a flower, but ultimately it's a creation of our lives, isn't it, and we should look after it, even if it means police guarding it 24-7. Yeah, no, absolutely, and Allah's most beautiful creations should be definitely um, protected. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of my friends and my family probably be quite happy that this flower is getting lots of protection because there are some, you know, like some people who are like completely fanatic about flowers and plants and I presume that maybe that's what they're, the police are also protecting the flower because obviously if it's rare, mm. then there must be loads of people probably after it, right? That, that's true, and that's exactly why they're saying that you have to make sure that there's, um, they, they are making sure there's CCTV footage. Um, apparently, collectors are prepared to pay up to £5,000 for one of these flowers. That's how rare and that's how um, valued it is if you're, you know, into flowers, etc. So I can see why it's very important for them to look after that. And also, I think Britain, in particular, out of the whole of Europe, is known for its gardens, isn't it? That's what we're famous mm. for British gardens and so they're saying you know for it's important that they make sure that this stays around and they grow it because of the fact that they want to they want to um, have it on display at things like in Kew Gardens and on flower displays and they won't be able to do that if it dies out it's, it's gone you know so. wow mm -hmm. wow just one plant that's it gosh well that's a, that's a great interesting article we should, we should try and implement that in everything that we do, you know, anything that we have, try and preserve and, and you know, like, for example, our own teachings of our Ahl al-Bayt, and what they said, you know, if, if, if today's society can do it for a flower, then, you know, we should definitely be doing it for our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and, and his whole, whole holy household. Inshallah, yeah, I think that's a very nice point, actually, that, you know, if, if something is so beautiful and rare, it should be protected, and inshallah, we'll be able to do that. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so now it's time for our creative segment. Um, do you are you into art, Tamara? Um, no, I'm really not. Do, do you think you're a bit of an artist? <laughs> um, no, my mum always tells everyone at the age of six, I was told that I'll never be good at art. So <laughs> clearly, I was bad from the start. Oh dear, yep, yep. Mm. Well, um, we actually visited a, um, an artist, and Aisha Ahmed, so uh, let's take a look at some of her work. My name's Aisha Ahmed, and um, I'm an artist. I started painting about 12 years ago after I left university and uh, I've, I've been painting on and off since then, although I did have a gap between eight years ago when I had my daughter. Um, I've been doing ceramics for about a year now, um, incorporating geometry into my work as well. Well, I've always been quite creative, like as a child, my parents will, will tell you that as a child I was um, always drawing or painting or doing something or other with, with art. Um, but in terms of doing it as an adult, it was just my, like my, ch I, I love art and I like to express myself. Um, even in terms of other career things I've done, they've been quite art centered. Uh, so it, it's not, it's not the main thing that I do. Like by day, I actually work in the nursing home sector but um, it's something that I do on the side and I really enjoy it. Basically, the premise of my work is that I use like henna or other organic materials and I combine them with um, different things to be able to cover a canvas with henna. And um, it, it's basically aspiring to get different textures onto canvas. And then I'll, I'll, over that, I'll incorporate paintwork or henna work. Um, calligraphy, geometry, wh whatever I choose to use. We have such a rich heritage and uh, within that there are so many different crafts and so many different ways that uh, Muslims in the past were trying to like glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether it's through calligraphy, geometry, um, you know the way that they incorporate that into gilding, the crafts, uh, manuscripts, all of that and 
all of that, well, whichever part of the world it was from, that was all, that's all our heritage. It's all relevant to who we are, whether it's from Iran or Turkey or uh, sub subcontinent. All of it is still belongs to us because we are all one Ummah. And one of the things that I really like to address in my work is whether you're black, white, Shia, Sunni, um, you know, Muslims are still one. And uh, that all of this, we, there's so much that we share. And, uh, and central to all of those things that we share is the divine. So those are the main things that motivate me to do what I do. This painting is called The Six Aeons of Time, um, basically, and it's basically uh, to describe this, how in, within the Muslim belief, we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the world and the universe within six stages, um, and each stage could last billions of years. But um, uh, the, the ayahs the that go around it are the ayahs from the Qur'an that talk about that and how um, just the amazing nature of his creation and um, the reason why I chose the, this particular six-point geometrical pattern is because it, because it has those six points. Um, but central to all of that is the earth, which is in like the greens and the blues, um, and how it's like a, a blast, it comes out like a blast. This piece is called The Breath of the Compassionate and the reason being is that um, when you've got this eight point star joined together, what you get in the middle is a, a, a cross and some of the classical geomet geometers, they actually said that it's like when the, the earth, every year the earth polarises and inhales and exhales and you've got the renewal of life and spring Spring being the opposite of autumn where everything's dying, spring revives as well. And they called it the breath of the compassionate because a Rahman, you know, he like brings things back to life every year. And it's like a cycle that we go through. But it, rather than seeing it as like a, a, a circular cycle, it's like a contraction and an extraction. So that, that's why this particular pattern is called um, breath of compassionate. But also, it's like the base of it is um, a combination of plaster and gauze, and I really liked the idea of how, um, like, when you've got a plaster cast, it's plaster and gauze, and but it's it's carrying, it's containing something, it's healing something, and I just like the way that you know the earth, you know, during the the autumn and the winter, the earth is like a cavity, and then spring, everything's sort of like revived and woken up the way that your, your bones would have he healed within a plaster cast. This particular piece is called um, Life Cycles in Hatai, and um, the whole idea is, as you can see, it's about the life cycle of a flower um, from the beginning as a baby bud to how it grows into its youth and, and flourishes, and then it basically starts wilting and dying. And the ayahs from the Qur'an that I chose for this particular piece are just to do, they're to do with that, but they're also to do with the fact that, you know, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he gives life to the dead earth. And, um, you know, I, 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 I was particularly, as we all should be, in, evoked by the theme of life and death, because it's something that's so close to our hearts and it should be with us every day. This particular piece is called um, A Good Word and it's dedicated to my very dear friend Alia who sadly, sadly passed away. And the reason why I chose the ayahs that talk about a good word is because like that a good word is like a good tree and it, you know, it reaches high into the sky. Is that she was, she was so driven to do so many good things and um, the impact of that was on so many people. And... Um, you know, I just, it was my way of sort of celebrating some of the stuff that she'd done. And the reason why I told, chose to use a gold box for the trees to be growing up in is um, that traditionally within Islamic art, gold, using gold within manuscripts or um, decorative arts was to illuminate something that's sacred. So like knowledge is sacred. But I think it's really interesting to sort of in the modern age extend that boundary and, and say that, well, hold on, 
using gold in a way where we're saying that, well, where we come from is is the most beautiful place that we come from, Allah. Or like if you use that to depict a good word, the root of a good word is a really sacred place. Um, so that's why I chose to use the gold box. And it's actually done on a backdrop of um, p powdered spice, but I've used a uh, beetroot to, to dye it. This piece is called Praise in the Festive Garden, and um, it's basically just about how uh, when I became a mother, everything changed and you know you start looking at things in the eyes of how your children would view things and um, one of the ways that children develop a really strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the beauty that's around them and um, if you look in, in a garden there are so many things that are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether it's the animals or the plants the trees and and just the immense beauty that grows within the garden and um, I, I liked the idea of using geometry, which is traditionally used within Islamic art, to, to, to use the geometry, to, to, use, to make flowers out of geometry rather than having like pretty little flowers. And um, to sort of like extend the boundaries of what, how you can use geometry um, within Islamic art. Um, the, base, the base of it is actually um, henna and it's got henna patterns around the edges and then there I've used like an, uh, different sort of organic materials which give it that cracked earth effect and then there's a layer of resin and then I've done my painting over that. So it's just to sort of like the, the different varieties of textures and uh, just to show the depth within like the world we live in and the earth that Allah's given us. In the work that I've done so far, it's, it's been so inspiring and so rewarding to be able to discuss things with um, non-Muslims and to use the artwork as a sort of like a, a bridge between Islam and the rest of the world and just to showcase that Islam isn't as barbaric or as negative as people often interpret it to be. Um, and to do that through art has been quite refreshing because when you when you look at art you're actually coming from a completely different angle and uh, so it's been a really positive platform to engage with different discussions along those lines. Wow, that's so amazing that the sister is doing so much fantastic artwork. Um, I've met her before at one of her workshops, so I've been to, along to one. Inshallah, I'll go to more in the future. But she's fantastic at what she does. And um, I know that you know she, she ran a, a workshop which was talking about um, the use of tiles. And she was talking specifically about Iranian artwork and how tiles feature very heavily in both their architecture and their artwork in general. And so what she did is she'd already cut out little coloured pieces of, of tile um, and she'd given it out like in boxes on tables. And then on what she had is she had like a, a board that was just a thick piece of wood, a thick slab of wood. And what you had to do was actually draw out the lines that were going to fit the tiles in. So it's probably like, I don't know, a couple of centimetres by a couple of centimetres. And then, um, so you make this design and in, in the middle, um, you basically need to make sure that the design, <coughs> excuse me, in the middle, the design's going to say Allah. So all around the outside, you've got like a thick border mm -hmm. of coloured tiles and in the middle, you write Allah. But you can sort of, you know, have tiles all around the, the actual name as well. And it was really fun doing it. One, because I guess we don't really get a chance to be so creative. These are well, I don't. I don't go along to many creative things. And I, you know, like I said to you, I'm not particularly into art, mainly because I'm rubbish, but also because I just, we don't really know where to start. And I know you don't really have to have a, a way to be creative, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I, I, I imagine like a, what she does is full enjoyment for her, obviously. And you know, obviously for us, if, if I think if I had the time, then I would find it really refreshing and creative and inspiring. But yeah, it's, it's just about finding the time. And also, I'm, I'm, I'm not that great. I think last time I did art was must have been, you know, oh my God, um, you know, more than a decade ago. So that's just, um, you know, really, really long time. But I think it's something that it's nice because obviously... Because you know it's religious, then um, you're kind of 
I like to think that it must be kind of form of ibadah because mm. you know when you're writing the the names of Allah or you're writing the kalma, then that's that's really really um, nice and, and it's 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 also your remembrance of Allah as well, which I think is is nice that when you're trying to do something creative or something like that, then you can bring in your worship as well. That's a really nice way of thinking of it, and I'm sure that would be accepted as a form of ibadah as well. But um, Another thing that I, I noticed in the workshop that I attended, and I'm sure this is the case for all parents out there as well, that the young kids absolutely loved it. And actually, I thought this is going to be a nightmare because there was glue everywhere, there's tiles, and there's you know slabs of wood, etc. But they were really responsible with all the artwork. I had my my cousin's daughters were there with me, very young, and you know they they were really interested in actually shaping this piece with me and and you know to figure out which color complements which other color and and like you said it's not just a form of ibadah but it's actually a form of expression isn't it and I think that's fantastic for younger kids as well as you know adults but with younger kids it's really using their imagination in a creative way yeah definitely okay now it's time to go to a very short break but after the break we have an interview with our very young guest who will be talking to us about reciting from a female perspective so stay tuned and we'll see you after the break Assalamu alaikum and welcome to your weekly edition of Morning Break. I'm Fatna Rizvi. And I'm Hamera Mirza. And today we have a jam-packed show for you with our regular features such as discussing current affairs. We have our life coach, we have Hadith of the Week and an interview with a very special guest. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to meeting our young special guest. I hear her all the time so it'll be great to actually finally meet her and put a, a, put a, a face to, to that beautiful, beautiful voice that she has. But right now it is your own and making, and, and you know, again, very much emphasized um, by all the imams is the fact that, um, you know, it's better to, it is better to die um, as a just person than to die, than to remain alive and be an unjust because of the fact that ultimately we are going to face Allah one day and we're going to have to answer for what we have done. And so I guess that the actions that are better here is, to, to make sure that you're sticking to what's right, the truth. That is so, so true, yeah. And obviously we are all accountable for our actions. So, of course, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's, it's better to be, um, definitely not to be uh, unjust or the, or the oppressor. And, um, yeah, hopefully our viewers can, can just time for Hadith of the Week. So, what Hadith have you picked out, Hamera? Well, I've picked a Hadith from Imam Ali al-Islam, and it is... Uh, prefer to be one who is overcome while being just rather than one who triumphs while being unjust. Um, and I mean, to be honest, the, the main reason why I picked this out was I just think that sentence is pretty much sums up what everything that happened in Karbala, all the events of, of what happened to Imam Hussein and his beloved family. And I just, I love the fact that here you've clearly got an example of a father passing his teachings to his son and not just passing teachings but they're literally living the teachings as well um, and I think that definitely take that on board too and take something away from Imam Ali Islam's um, great words mm. inshallah definitely okay so now it's time for article of the week this week we have an article from the independent newspaper um, and it's the title of it is Britain's rarest flower given round-the-clock police protection. I just chose this because I found it quite funny, although I totally understand where they're coming from. Apparently there's this rare flower, um, in, in the UK anyway, that's called a lady slipper or orchid. Um, and I, I actually checked out a picture of it to see what all the fuss is about. And it's, it's a very beautiful flower. It almost looks a little bit like a, a, sh like a slipper. Um, it's really important that concept is something that runs throughout Islam, which is that concept of justice. Absolutely, yeah, and also um, it's just like, um, I think it's reiterating also the fact that um, make sure that you're not the oppressor. So, you know, if you're oppressed, but make sure that you are not the, the one that is subjecting oppression. And of course we can see that the Ahl Bayt al were the ones that were the most severely, severely oppressed. Yeah, I completely agree with what you said about making sure that we aren't the oppressor. And I think that's something that's particularly uh, prominent within Islam in general. Um, and, you know, many times we've heard the Imams 
mention, you know, things like making sure that you protest, making sure you stand up for other people's rights as well as